Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, Reflections, Goals, and object Objectives. Oh my, best practices for creating individualized learning plans. My name is Jenny Miner, and I will help facilitate today's webinar. This is the second in a series of webinars focused on navigating the shift to competency-based medical education brought to you by a partnership between STFM and the AFMRD. We hope to see you at the next webinar on February 14th titled, Let's Talk About Entrustment. You may register for this upcoming event at stfm.org slash CBME webinars. During this webinar, please utilize the Q&A feature to ask questions of the panelists. Although you may ask questions at any time, designated time has been set aside to answer your questions toward the end of the presentation. Today's panelists are members of STFM's Competency-Based Medical Education Task Force, which has been instrumental in creating the CBME Toolkit for Residency Programs, which can be accessed at stfm.org slash CBME Toolkit. Please join me in welcoming today's panelists, Dr. Aaron Lambert, Clinical Associate Professor and Residency Program Director at Cabarrus Family Medicine Residency, and Pamela McMillan, Residency GME Administrator Coordinator at the University of Wyoming Family Medicine Residency Program. And now Dr. Lambert will begin today's presentation. Hi everybody, I'm glad you're here. Thank you for joining us. Um, we're going to talk a little today about individualized learning plans, since they are a new ACGME requirement for all residents, as we know, beginning in July of this year. Uh, maybe you aren't using them currently and you need some help getting started, or maybe you already are using ILPs and you just want some helpful tips, or maybe you're somewhere in between. Um, either way, hopefully we'll have a few pearls for you to take away, uh, and we appreciate your time. But first... Uh, we would like to know a little more about our audience. So we have um, a couple of uh, poll questions just to kind of get a feel for, for who's out there and, and who's listening. So uh, if you could just take a second and uh, answer those two questions for us, uh, that'll help us kind of uh, adjust our, our talking for our audience a little bit. Hopefully not too many of you were affected by the storms yesterday. Your internet is still working, or I guess you wouldn't be on this if it wasn't. Some of you are under nine inches of snow, we heard. Some of us have just a lot of mud. All right. So a, a pretty even mix. Program directors, APDs, core faculty, some coordinators. Um, and a good number of you uh, fairly new into uh, the GME world. Very good. All right. Well, let's get let's move on to the next slide then. Um, so what is required of us? Let's just take a minute to refresh ourselves. The new ACGME guide, training guidelines um, say that program directors with the clinical competency clinical competency committee, uh, must assist residents in developing individualized learning plans, both to capitalize on their strengths and to identify more areas for growth. We have to create this document at least once a year and provide a system uh, to help residents in the, along the process, including some mentorship, um, creating those educational experiences, and then having a system for tracking and monitoring progress if we set goals we need to make sure that we're actually uh, progressing and, and achieving those goals. So our objectives today um, are uh, particularly, if we can move to the next slide, um, to describe the differences between a remediation plan and an individualized learning plan, which sometimes can be a little confusing. Um, there's a lot, there's some overlap. Um, we're also going to talk about components of what actually goes in a learning plan, individualized learning plan, at least at, at the basics. And then a few pearls to help if you need help getting started or you're not completely satisfied with the IOP that you already have, um, some pearls that will help you uh, moving along there. Uh, next poll question, just out of curiosity, um, how confident are you uh, if you had to explain the difference to someone between a remediation plan and a learning plan, how do you feel? 
Albert Einstein uh, famously said, if you can't explain it to a six-year-old, you don't understand it yourself. So if you had to explain to a first grader remediation plan versus individual learning plan, how do you feel about it? Inquiring minds want to know. All right, how do people feel? Not surprisingly, most people kind of fall in the middle. I think I can, but please don't make me ask it, answer it out loud. Um, some of you feel very confident. Only a few of you are uh, a little in the dark about the differences, so that's good. Um, that's what we're gonna talk about on the next slide. So keeping that, um, keeping that first objective in mind, we are gonna enlist help from Monica, our illustrious chief resident, who uh, just heard that these new requirements come out and she is always on top of things and she wants to know exactly what the difference is. And then we have Steve, our PGY2, who's on remediation again. And he says, but isn't, isn't an ILP just a remediation plan with a different name? Come on, what's really going on? So next slide, please. Um, let's look a little bit at how these um, are similar and different. They do have some commonalities. Um, both remediation and learning plans outline ways to help learners improve their roadmaps to improvement. Um, both of them do use uh, concrete benchmarks for achievement, so you everyone knows what is expected and when it has been accomplished. Remediation plans, though, typically, and this is uh, this is not in every situation, but typically remediation plans are more reactive. Um, they are made in response to some sort of deficiency, either in learner performance or learner knowledge. Remediation plans are only for some learners. Um, they, they typically, again, only get made if you have a deficiency. So not every learner has a remediation plan and that can sometimes lead to a stigma of uh, that in that learner's mind that they are less than. Um, remediation plans tend to focus more on the, the minimum training requirements um, and those become the goal. Because there is a deficiency, the goal of a remediation plan is to get the resident back up to the minimum um, so that they can advance and eventually graduate. Learning plans, on the other hand, think of remediation plans as the treatment and learning plans as the prevention. Learning plans, um, under this system at least, are meant for everyone. Um, they are there to help prevent the deficiencies, um, or at least the bigger gaps, um, and be a little more proactive. Um, they are helpful typically for all learners, and because all learners have one or will have one, um, I think it helps eliminate or at least um, minimize that stigma of, oh gosh, I got to meet with my advisor, we got to make a learning plan, I must not be good enough. My, I think my biggest hope as an educator is that as we move toward everyone having a learning plan, that that stigma goes away and it just becomes the normal um, envir learning environment that everyone learns uh, in their own way. So learning plans also recognize personal learning styles. Uh, they help acknowledge that not all learners learn at the same rate. Um, they may learn very quickly in one content area, but slower in another. Um, and so they allow for that. And then learning plans are more focused on the end goals, especially within the realm of CBME. Uh, we're focused, learning plans are focused on achieving mastery, not just the minimum requirement, not just competency, but mastery and what skills do you need um, for your future practice? So moving beyond um, the minimum. It does require, I think both are necessary um, we certainly, in, a, in this new uh, new training world, everyone's going to have a learning plan, but there certainly uh, is a place for remediation still when it's needed. But historically, I think if your program is like mine and many others, I think historically we have used remediation plans a lot more. Um, but aren't we all about preventative care in family medicine? Isn't that what we do? Uh, this does require a bit of a culture shift, though, I think that starts from the top with program directors and, and core faculty um, to make sure that we are using this shared language um, and, and talking about mass content mastery, um, talking about strengths uh, and, and normalizing the idea that you have a learning plan, not because you're in trouble, 
but because they are helpful and they are helping guide and individualize your education. They're not just remediation plans with a new name. So the more that we as faculty use those terms, uh, the more we can shift that culture, I think. Um, now, when we are creating learning plans, um, we need to keep our audience in mind on both sides. So interesting study um, in the Journal of Lifelong Learning in Psychiatry about um, characteristics of different generations. And I don't wanna make this into a generational debate. I recognize this is painting with a broad brush and it does not describe everybody born, everybody born in a certain year. But I do think there are some pearls to take away. One is that right now we have um, physicians from four different generational groups who are actively seeing patients right now. And that impacts how we view our patients. It impacts how we view what training should look like. And as we on the faculty side are creating these learning plans and trying to shift this culture, I think it's good to do a little self-reflection uh, of our own to say, well, how do I see the world? How do I see training? Um, and to, to try to minimize what I have been guilty of as, as uh, sometimes of saying, well, but that's not the way we used to do it, or I don't see how I can do it with these, you know, under these restrictions, that sort of thing. It's not better or worse, it's just different. Um, education changes as we go, and we need to be able to change with it. Um, although we have faculty and, and practicing physicians from all four generations, Right now, the majority of our learners on the other side of this ILP table are in that millennial uh, age group, in that millennial generation. And we have to be able to, there are, every generation has their strengths and has their challenges. And if we want to be good educators, we have to be able to adapt what we do and respond, be responsive to the people that we are teaching or we risk becoming outdated. Um, so particularly out of this whole chart, um, there are a couple of lines that I've highlighted there that I think are really interesting, the, both the feedback preference and the work-life balance, because I think both of those have been um, sticking points and sometimes have, have been um, barriers to good communication um, amongst faculty and residents. There is a difference in how we expect um, to receive feedback. Uh, the millennial generation in general, expects to get lots of feedback and anytime, you know, anytime that it is useful or anytime they want it and want more flexibility and options in the work-life balance. And that is not a bad thing. Um, perhaps they are advocating a little bit more for that balance that we should have been, the rest of us should have been all along, but we still need to set appropriate expectations so that the training and the content is learned. I say this and include this slide only to say we need to make sure that we are responsive to the generation we're teaching um, and that we are we are creating our curriculum, we're creating our learning plans, we are shifting our own cultures and acknowledging our own biases um, as we try to teach them and lead them. Another thing to um, keep in mind as we make these learning plans are the pillars of uh, competency-based medical education. Next slide, please. Um, as, we, as we create these learning plans and we're writing down goals and objectives and we're discussing with the residents their, their strengths and their challenges, we need to think, are the things that I'm writing, are the things I'm including in this learning plan, are they focused on outcomes? The outcomes are really where we are headed with CBME, not did you spend enough time on cardiology rotation? Um, did you check the boxes? But did you learn what you need for your future practice? Do you have the skills that we expect you will need after you graduate? So focusing on outcomes when you're writing these ILPs. Are we being supportive of, of the learner's progression of their learning? Are we making building blocks and not big jumps? You know, are, are we giving them appropriate level expectations and learning opportunities as a brand new intern versus a second year versus a finishing third year? 
Is there a progression of expectations, a progression of autonomy, um, a progression of, of challenges um, for them so that they can grow in achievable steps? Is it flexible for each individual and kind of tied to their abilities? Obviously that's in the name, you know, that it's individualized. Um, and we'll talk about that a lot more uh, in a minute. Um, are we being responsive to learner needs? Um, and this also gets onto um, the idea of coaching. It mentions coaching techniques. There is a whole uh, separate webinar on coaching that's gonna be coming up later. So I'm not gonna dive into that a lot right now, but stay tuned, a little teaser for a future webinar. Um, but essentially, are we, are we listening to the learner when they come back? These ILPs are not meant to be a, a unidirectional communication where we tell them what we think they're doing well and not and what they need to do to get better. Um, that's, that's becoming a little bit outdated under the new CBME model. It is more, we certainly still include that, but it is much more of a discussion. Are we listening to them when they say, I really don't feel comfortable with this yet um, and making sure that we, we respond to those things. And then assessments as well. And there's another webinar on assessments later, um, but are we getting, we need to know that they have mastered this content and these skills. And in order to do that, we need lots of different assessments. There is no one single way of evaluating a resident that is going to give them everything they need. Um, so when you're writing your ILP and you're making your objectives and you're answering the question, how am I going to know the resident achieved this? Think about all the different ways that you could evaluate and assess that resident and make sure that you're including those in there. Next slide. So let's talk about um, what's really uh, needs to be in an ILP. We have our wonderful program director, Dr. Anita Wynn, and she says, I'm in on this, I wanna get better, what's in an ILP? One of her core faculty, Dr. Hugh Grumpy, unfortunately is just kind of a little more skeptical saying how much more work is this really gonna cost me? I'm not so sold on this. So let's, let's talk about it because it is important as we create new structures for doing this, that it is not overburdensome on either the faculty or the resident side, that it's achievable amount of workload um, for both of them to be successful. So that leads us to our next audience question. Um, if you could get ready for that, how do you feel about your current uh, ILP format if you have one? Um, if you're using an uh, individual learning plan right now, you're like, oh my gosh, it's great. I'm just here to humor the presenters to make them feel good so they have a bigger crowd. Um, or maybe you say, you know, it's, it's good, um, but I think it probably could be better. Maybe you say, well, we have one. I can't remember where we keep it. Uh, it might be somewhere. Or you were just hoping I wouldn't even ask this question because you don't have one yet. What's our what's the our audience saying right now? Where where is everybody? Hopefully most people at least have one that uh, is somewhat functional as a starting point. But if you don't, we can help you with that in just a couple of slides. So not a lot of you feel real fabulous. Thank you, everybody's, sounds like everybody's here to actually learn and not just humor us, although we do enjoy being humored. Um, it looks like the majority of people have a pretty good one, but maybe it could be better. Um, some people still need to work on making one. So let's talk about that. Um, next slide. With all that in mind, um, I want you to keep in mind, simpler is better. If you have a, a basic template that is gonna that has all the requisite parts, but isn't too long, isn't too complicated, doesn't take too long to fill out, I think it's gonna be more successful for you. Um, people are more likely to complete a one page ILP versus a six or eight page ILP. Um, they're more likely to do it more frequently. So thinking about at a minimum, what do we need to look at in learning plans? One thing is, is self-reflection. Millennial learners typically prefer multiple learning formats, not, any, not too much of any one type of format, and they're more engaged. There is, there is data and good study, educational studies to say that, that millennial learners are more engaged when they have more choices. 
Um, so allowing time for self-reflection um, for the learners, building some protected time in for that um, so that they can um, really go, what have I, what have I learned and what do I still need to get better at? Um, and along with uh, a little bit of coaching from their uh, faculty advisor or coach or mentor uh, to kind of guide them a little bit in that reflection um, really can help with their own self-discovery because aren't we trying ultimately to make lifelong learners? Um, what is going to, what is going to instill in them the desire to continue to learn and grow when they are out of your doors and, and done with residency, it's building these habits of self-reflection um, and growth. Um, the other thing uh, is strengths and struggles. So we know from lots of child development studies that process praise, um, praising what they, are, what they are doing and how hard they worked and the effort that they put in yields more of a growth mindset than person praise. So rather than at, for younger age kids, we talk about not saying you are such a smart girl, but saying you worked really hard on that. I'm proud of you. That doesn't stop when we become adults. We forget that sometimes, but we never get too old to want to hear praise. And as we are working with these residents, if you think, keep in mind, you, are, you want to praise the process, you want to praise their creativity, their, their ingenuity, their hard work, the fact that they stuck with it and stayed, um, you know, stayed late and helped that other resident. And rather than praising the individual person, that is going to encourage that growth mindset. But making strengths and struggles, what are you, what do you feel that you're good at right now? What do you feel like you still need to work on is, is a big part of your ILP. Um, Kind of along those lines, what do you think you need for future practice? I think this is really where we can get buy-in. We think about, oh my gosh, as I write this, how am I going to get the resident on board with doing any of this work? It's just going to end up all being me writing this. I think this is where we really get their buy-in because residents, for the most part, I mean, there's a normal life cycle to a resident, but for the most part, residents are excited. They're enthusiastic about if not about their next call shift, they're excited about their future job one day and where they're going to be. Um, it's part of what keeps all of us residency faculty feeling so young, right, as we're around all this useful energy. Um, and so this, I think, is really where we get the residents buy-in um, to be engaged in the process, is we link in um, their future practice needs to what they're doing right now and we show that the two things are related so they don't just feel like I'm checking another box so I can graduate. If you can say, but what do you plan to do? We all know that what a resident plans to do in July of their intern year is probably gonna look a little different than May of their third year, but that doesn't matter. Ask them each step along the way. There's even some learning in seeing how that grows over time. There's sort of character development arc of sorts when you can say as a third year you know when you started as an intern you were thinking you were going to be a hospitalist and now you want to be a rural full spectrum doctor i wonder why that was like why did that happen there is there is learning even in that reflecting so at every stage of residency i would encourage you um, to try to tie ask them what if you had to decide today what your future practice was going to be what would you do and then say, all right, what do we need to teach you? How, what do you need to gain to be able to do that? And it's going to link in some of that excitement about the future to what they're doing now. And I think it's going to help um, get them more engaged. Um, and then finally, you know, we always want to have very clear expectations. Um, so we need to have some, uh, I have goals on there, but technically um, they're objectives um, that we think about we all we all know smart objectives, but I will encourage you and push you a little to say smarty objectives. And if we can go to the next slide, if that is an unfamiliar term or you're like, great, they're adding two more letters to the acronym. I finally got it memorized. Um, smarty objectives may be a new, uh, a little bit of new phrase for you. Some of it you've probably heard before. When we outline objectives of what is this resident going to do, um, we want it to be specific and measurable because we want to ensure the learner can demonstrate the competency. We can't just say get better at writing notes. 
how in the world are we going to know when they have achieved that? That is not specific. It is not measurable. So you want objectives that are very specific, that are very measurable. You want them to be attainable. You don't set a goal for them that they don't really have a chance of reaching, either because it's beyond their skill set where they are right now, or maybe it's because you don't have that learning opportunity within your program or your community. Um, we're, we're setting them up to fail. So making sure that what you're asking them to do uh, is attainable and is it relevant? This kind of gets back to why am I learning this? Am I just checking a box or is there a purpose? I think um, particularly the learners that we have right now are very uh, purpose driven. I want to know that what I'm doing matters. So this relevance um, really ties in probably more than it ever has. Show them that there is a purpose and a reason either for themselves or for their community or for the program. And that uh, goes a long way. And then obviously time-based, you need a deadline. Um, you need to have been able to do this by this date or it will never get done. Um, that, is, that also doesn't stop happening when, when we become full-fledged adults either, unfortunately. So the SMART portions are probably familiar to most of you, but the I and the E um, is where I'm going to challenge you just a little bit if you're not already doing it. Think about the inclusivity and the equitability. So encourage learners as much as possible um, to keep those thoughts in their mind and when they're and in their objectives. Um, inclus being inclusive simply means have you considered all the populations that are involved in this outcome, um, either that will be affected by what by this new procedure you're trying to learn, or that will be involved in giving you feedback, or that will have to stay later in clinic or take time out of what they're doing to help teach you. Have you considered all of those uh, groups of people uh, when it's appropriate? And equitability is, does it address um, disparities or unique circumstances of different populations? So. As an example, you're probably thinking, yeah, that sounds good, but what does that really mean? So you might set a goal to complete all, resident will complete all clinic notes within one business day. Um, that is a relatively smart objective, um, but uh, if you wanted to add the I or the E, maybe that at being a little more inclusive, resident will complete all clinic notes within one business day, seeking input from preceptors and nursing staff on how to be more efficient with time. Think about if it takes you longer, that affects your preceptor's inbox and management uh, and the, the quality of the feedback they can give. It affects your nursing staff of how long you're taking in clinic and do they have to stay late uh, and end up getting paid overtime. Um, these are groups of people that could be involved in this objective. So have you, have you considered the, uh, how you could include them? Um, for the equity, uh, an easy one to think about. Within three months, resident will improve recognition of malignant skin lesions by 50% on the DERM case studies. That is a smart objective. If you wanted also to be equitable, you would add on the end of that, including at least 20% uh, of lesions on darker skin tones. Um, think about the uh, the other populations and are you showing the unique circumstances of it's different to recognize the same rash on uh, different colored skin tones. Um, so thinking about that uh, inclusivity, that equitability part, there's a little bit of overlap. So it, it doesn't really, it's not super important that you say, well, does this fall under the I or the E bucket? Just that you're thinking about those things and being more uh, well-rounded. Dr. Lambert? So, yes. We have a question from our audience um, asking if we could please explain inclusivity a bit more. They're still a little bit muddy on that that piece of it. So could you explain that just a little bit more? I can certainly try. Um, so in, when we think about inclusivity, um, let's say um, you were going to make a goal to learn a new procedure. Um, Maybe a new, your resident needs to get better at placing IUDs or uh, long-term contraceptives. Perhaps as part of that goal, rather than just focusing on the skill itself, you might want to include within that goal um, how, them, how they could incorporate other populations. Maybe you have a free clinic or a student-run clinic 
um, could they incorporate those populations that that um, may not otherwise have access um, as both from the resident side, uh, inclusivity side, they could help be a learning uh, environment for that procedure, but also uh, including those populations in that, how will they benefit from it? Could we specifically target this learning experience in one of those clinics so that those populations can benefit from it, being inclusive of, of specific populations? Not sure if that's helpful or not. We can certainly chat more later. Um, so thinking about um, what an ILP actually looks like uh, in, in form and function, if we can go to the next slide. Um, if you are one of those people who responded that we don't really have a good template yet, or we have one, but I'm not real happy with it, um, good news, the uh, CBME task force has created a template um, that you are certainly welcome to use. That's what we made it for. This is not, and you can see it on your screen right now, this is a template that is accessible um, for anybody from the STFM's uh, CBME toolkit. The web address is right there. Um, and this is what it looks like. Um, there is no exact right way to do this. Um, what we have put up on the screen there in front of you, the template that we have come up with, is meant to be a starting point. It is meant to be um, to include the basics, um, and is there is plenty of room for you to customize it to what fits for your program. Um, but what you see there, just to kind of walk through it a little bit, it's got the resident's name, their advisor, or coach, and the date that you are reviewing it, because in, these should be reviewed multiple times throughout the year, ideally. Um, so. Uh, and then we group things to try and simpler is better. We tried to keep it in three main buckets and we linked them to the ILP. So the individual, the learning and the plan. So the first section, the individual, this is where a lot of the self-reflection comes into play. As of right now, today, my future practice goals include, um, and then also asking them, what do you think you still need to work on for your future career? So that is the individual section. And that is a lot of this self-reflection. Um, the learning section, this is where we uh, push the learner to go back to their last ILP, the most recent ILP done. Look at the objectives that you had there and reflect on whether that you actually achieved them or not, or do they still need more attention? And I know for us, sometimes we didn't do great. We, we made the objectives. We said, great, here's the stuff you're going to work on. But how often do we really go back again and say, did you achieve these or not? What do we need to do? Maybe you do, and that's great. Um, but that's that's hard sometimes. We we make the we make the objectives, we make the goals, and then we kind of say, great, we did that, and we move on. Um, so the learning is also part of the reflection, but also kind of the strengths and struggles a little bit too. Uh, and then the, the last section, the plan, this is where you make um, your SMARTY objectives. You think about those growth areas. Did I achieve all of my objectives from last time? If not, maybe you need to bring one forward. Maybe there's a new thing that has new opportunity to grow uh, that has come up. We use the term growth areas, um, meaning rather than weaknesses, you know, this is an area that you have an opportunity to grow in. Um, and then we put in there as well, um, uh, specifically a wellness objective, just to try to keep that uh, balance in mind as well. As you're writing these objectives, obviously the SMARTY format, but also what we want to do is keep in mind the core outcomes of family medicine, which um, are also uh, kind of a new, newly introduced to us this year. And those are on the next slide. So if you, oh, before we move on to the side, sorry. Um, at the top right, you will see that there is a box with um, hyperlinks um, to the core outcomes and to a mapping project I'll tell you about in a minute. Uh, and then maybe one day to a personal portfolio for those programs who are using portfolio records. Those hyperlinks in our template are not active yet. Um, I hope they will be one day, but you can certainly make your own links, uh, hyperlinks within a, if you have a live electronic document and Pamela will talk about that a little bit more in a minute. Um, so. The next slide is just a reminder as we are writing these objectives, as much as you can try to tie these these objectives to some of the 15 core outcomes that we are going to be um, required to attest 
two for our graduates, um, the first five beginning with this current third year class, uh, the next, the first 10 uh, in July of 20, or June of 2025, and then all 15 we will need to attest to our graduates by 2026. Um, so I think this is also an opportunity to kind of bring some meaning and some purpose. You are doing this objective because it will make you better at providing comprehensive care of children. And that is something that family medicine uh, physicians should be able to do. It kind of helps uh, pull it forward to their future career. Um, for uh, those of you who are interested, there is also on the same CBME toolkit website, um, a mapping project where we have linked the these 15 core outcomes to the 19 uh, milestones that we use that are milestones being more and sub competencies being more specific observable behaviors. Um, saying, are you modeling lifelong learning is really hard to directly observe, um, but you can you can track that number 10 core outcome to several of the milestones that are specific uh, learning opportunities. So if you need to be able to say, this resident is not great at diagnosing and managing common mental health conditions yet, what kind of activities could I make for them in their ILP? You can go to the learning, to the mapping project and see specific observable behaviors of sub competencies and milestones that you can maybe design some learning opportunities around. So um, I didn't include the actual mapping spreadsheet here because it's very busy and a little overwhelming, honestly, to look at in one slide. Um, but you can uh, go on the on the toolkit and look at that as well. All right. And with that, I am going to um, transition over to Pamela. Thank you, Dr. Lambert. I just wanted to add here that we did have um, one of our question and answers. It was more of a comment from someone just talking about the SMARTY goals. And they said that smarter objectives are better. The E stands for energizing and the R stands for rewarding. And I, I thought that was a good way to look at that too. So thank you for that comment. Um, super, super helpful. Uh, now we're going to move on to uh, tips and tricks maybe on how you get started with creating an ILP. Um, and here we have May Go For It program coordinator. She is super excited and raring to go thinking that, um, that her program is prepared and ready to get started creating her ILP. So let's go ahead and, and move on to the next slide here, please. Um, and so when we think about creating ILPs, Dr. Lambert just shared with all of you, one of the ILPs that the um, CBME task force created, I would like to include that um, on that subcommittee for these ILPs, we did have a resident physician that was part of that conversation. And so he was super helpful for us to, to keep in, in mind the resident's perspective and, and adding those reflection pieces, which I think is super helpful. And we would encourage you to include your resident's um, reflections and feedback in those. So when we're creating these ILPs, obviously we wanna collaborate with the resident and we want this to be a, a guided self-reflection from the resident's perspective. And so um, keep in mind the residents, we have so many different residents' perspectives. We're not gonna please everyone, uh, which I think is super hard for a lot of us in the GME world, but we know that residents all want to talk about their goals and objectives. And so, keeping an open mind on how that can be self-reflective in your ILP is super helpful. And we also want to make sure that the connections um, that we're using within this ILP are why each experience um, in that learning process is important to not only the resident, but also to the faculty, the advisors, and the program directors. So uh, we always want to make sure that these forms are easily accessible to both the learner, the resident, the advisor, the coach, the program director, and also your residency administrator. Those, those pieces are important as well. Um, can we go to the next slide, please, here? And so I'm just going to talk briefly here. The, this is an, our next slide that we're going to ask for questions, but... Um, when we create these ILPs, all programs are doing this differently, and I think it's important to know that there's no right way or wrong way to do that. Um, we have been collaborating with New Innovations, which is a software system that a lot of programs use. Also, we are um, in, 
and works with a med hub as well to to create uh, some sort of a live document within their software. Um, the form that Dr. Lambert shared with you just a little bit ago that's available on the CBME toolkit through STFM, that form can actually be created in a live document within Office 365. Um, it, it also can be used um, within like a Google document or a SharePoint document. And those, those documents are easier to be accessible and to be a live document. And so you're using that information from the very beginning of when your resident is starting with you in your program, your advisor or coach is meeting with that resident at the very beginning of their, their learning process within the program. And you're filling out, the resident is filling out their portion, the advisor can fill out their portion, they can meet together and talk about those goals and objectives. And that form is gonna stay live within your um, institution's systems and however you do that, my, my program. Um, uses Office 365, and so we can share those documents through OneDrive, and the resident has access to that form, the advisor has access to that form, and so does the program director. And then when we go to meet with that resident again in three months for their next advisor meeting, that same document is available to us, we can see the information, it's live in front of us, and we can just scroll down and create the same information on this same document and being able to, to follow through and to make sure that we're answering all of those questions that Dr. Lambert talked about. You know, what are the objectives? What are they talking about? What are they wanting to learn? What do they need to, to work on? Um, where are they at with their wellness? You know, uh, and you can just pick up where you left off in the form. And so you're not constantly having to go back and forth, which I think has been a big struggle for a lot of programs. Um, so just keep an open mind when you're creating these forms. And if you have questions, obviously, please feel free to reach out to Dr. Lambert or to myself or to Dr. Tulshian. Um, we are more than happy to answer questions and, and, and fill in the gaps there. But again, all programs are gonna do this differently and that is okay. The framework that we've given you is, is a perspective from all different sides. And it, we also we feel that it's very important that the residents are a big part of this process when we're doing these ILPs. Um, I see a, a, a question over here again in our question and answer, and I'm just gonna go ahead and answer this live here. Um, would love to know what you're using in new innovations. I asked for a way to get the information together and was told new innovations does not have the capability to do that. Um, and so, yes, I would tell you that we are in the process of working with new innovations on trying to figure out how to create a live document. Um, there's multiple ways to use the software. I will tell you, I've, I've been using new innovations now since 2004, and they've come a long way, but there is still some work to be done. And so um, the STFM task force is working with new innovations to create a way for that document to be alive. So once we have all the answers, we will definitely keep you all in the loop and make sure that that you know how to do all those things within the software. Um, another live question here. Will you also be working with metrics on that document? I have never heard of metrics, but we are more than happy to. Um, if you could send some more information, you have Dr. Lambert's email and mine here on the screen. Please send us that uh, information. If you have a contact person, we're more than happy to reach out to them and figure out a way to create or to collaborate with them on how to have an, uh, a live ILP as well. One other question that sometimes comes up is at what point should we make the first ILP? Um, I know there's been a lot of discussion within our own faculty. Do we do this for... Um, do we wait three months? Do we wait six months after the first CCC review right at the beginning? I would encourage if we're talking about a proactive plan um, to uh, help enhance their learning, that can't come too early. Uh, I think the, the initial ILP really could be done as early as orientation uh, or certainly early. And it's a great chance for them to meet their faculty mentor, advisor, or coach uh, and get to know them a little bit. Um, but also to say right now, as you are starting your residency journey, what do you think you want to be when you grow up? And what do you think your strengths and, and struggles are from medical school? Um, and uh, how can we best address those in these first few months of residency to avoid you kind of digging yourself into a hole? You know, how can we keep you afloat right from the beginning? 
Um, there's another question about, uh, does the ACGME require us to update the ILP for residents annually, or is it one and done as an intern? So the, the training requirements um, on the first, uh, one of the earlier slides, uh, it does say um, that uh, create a document and a system in a system in developing an individual learning plan that is updated at least annually. So at least once a year, uh, really, if we're talking about giving them good feedback and a, a kind of making course corrections and adjustments, probably ought to be doing it more often than that. Um, I maybe even three or four times a year. But again, that's kind of where it comes into having a a more brief achievable form that doesn't seem so daunting. If you think, oh my gosh, I have to fill that out three times a year. Maybe that means the form is a little too cumbersome uh, and think about ways that you could streamline it a little bit better. Well, there's another question here. How are programs tracking these? Um, that is also a requirement and the understanding is granular. This is meant to be, it's kind of unclear, Dr. Lambert. Yeah. So. <laughs> I don't know that we're live tracking. Um, it, it, we'll see how, how um, when we do our, our web ads every year, like what we have to submit. But um, I think it's more of a be ready to prove it if you're if you're asked or audited sort of thing. So just having, I, th I think in terms of tracking, if you're doing it and you're keeping the documentation on file somewhere, so that if someone says at a site visit, hey, are you doing ILPs? Show me you can pull the documents up. I don't, I don't think there's um, any, any kind of more live tracking um, that we need to do for that. If somebody else knows, please let me know. Um, I'm reading the next one here, just a second. Uh, discussion and guidance around developing ILPs for professionalism issues and difficult personality traits. Yes, um, my residents hear me say a lot, I can remediate a knowledge deficit all day long, remediating personality is difficult. Um, I don't have a lot of great advice for you on that. I, I have been through that myself as a program director. I will say focusing on observable behaviors obviously is important. Um, talking about the process and not the person. Um, I think this is where the mapping project could come into play because you have that um, core outcome uh, sorry, let me pull it up. You have the core outcome about modeling professionalism, core outcome number five. Uh, and if you pull the mapping project up, you can find um, several milestones that are uh, sub-competencies that are more observable behaviors and try to focus on building learning activities based off of those. And treat it like you would any other skill deficit. You, you are here. I need you to be here. And here are the things, that important piece that we sometimes leave out is here are the things I'm gonna, we're gonna do to help you get there. Uh, uh, somebody else asked, would, oh, sorry, Pamela. Oh, you're, go ahead. Somebody else asked, uh, I'd like to know who's primarily responsible for creating the ILP. It should be done together. Obviously, residents are not gonna do anything that's not, you know, that is, uh, we don't, request or require them to do. Um, so we need to have, as a program, we need to have that expectation of this is something we do and put the purpose to it. Here is why we do this. Um, here is why we do these ILPs and why we do them however often that you're gonna do them. Um, but in terms of actually creating the document, they really ought to be done together. Um, ideally, the resident self-reflects and starts to answer those some of those questions. And then they bring it to their advisor or their coach uh, who kind of adds their own perspective in and together they work on uh, what the priorities are uh, and how to, um, what, what to aim for for the next few months. I think the other benefit to doing it frequently throughout the year, uh, if you set goals for improvement that are 12 months long, you really can lose momentum very quickly and it seems like an overwhelming bite to chew. Um, so if you say, look, we're just looking at the next two or three months, I would like to see you do this. You can, it, it helps kind of narrow, narrow things down and not seem so overwhelming. Um, a little bit smaller bites that, that you can progress as they go. Great. 
Um, Dr. Meissner here says, although this change can seem overwhelming, the key is to get, get started and modify as time marches forward. As others have pointed out in the past, Rome wasn't built in a day, but the Romans worked on it every day. And that's excellent advice. This is a work in progress. And we know that that things are going to change over time. And, and you will find as you work through this process with your ILP that there may be things as a program that you decide that you want to look differently or you want it to change, which is super helpful if you're doing this live document. You're going to be able to change that as you go and you'll be able to see the progression and what those changes are. So it's tracking it in that document as you're going throughout the residence time within your program. One of the good pieces of advice along those lines that I got as a when I was a junior faculty, um, when you get that que that dreaded question, "What are your three-year goals, your five-year goals, your ten-year goals?" Um, I had a great mentor who said, "Look at your career, and in a residence case, look at your training as a river, and you kind of know where you're going to end up, but you can't read all the rapids from the river changes, and you can't read all the rapids." before you start your journey. So think of it more as a series of small course corrections as you read the rapids, rather than plotting out your entire course and, and trying to stick to it. Um, so I think ILPs can be kind of like that. Think of them as a series of small course corrections. Uh, and that kind of gets to another uh, question someone else had is, is um, they use their ILP to help structure elective time um, and all the layers of things that we already track uh, with patient care and daily evaluations and milestones is an ILP duplicative? I think that's a very fair question. I, I think it can be. I think it depends on how you, and this is a, an opinion of one, I, I think it depends on how you structure it. If I think you can structure, you can design your ILP with whatever components you want, um, and there's no exact right way. And if you already know that you track these other things, then what is it that you're not getting at and focus your ILP on that? Or is, is there a, a drive and engagement and an ambition, um, a different set of goals to track that, that isn't really being captured or do you need your ILP to kind of all, all those other milestones and evaluations are individual points of data. Do you need something that really, pulls it all together and says, where are you and where do you need to get to? Um, we're, we're concerned about the outcomes, the end result. Um, how can we make this meaningful and useful? Because residents don't love filling out more forms, but neither do we, uh, if we don't find purpose in them. We get frustrated with paperwork and with forms and with surveys and evaluations because we don't find meaning in them, right? We get frustrated because we think nobody else is gonna read this on the other end after I do all this work, or we're gonna fill this all out and then never look at it again. Um, or these are all questions that they already know the answer to, they're just making me fill out all over again. Those are all very valid reasons for all of us to not like filling out forms. So think about, I challenge you to think about as you design your ILP, what can you put in there that's meaningful to pull this all together, to bring purpose to their training, to connect their training to their future practice and leave some of the other checky box stuff out that you're already tracking so it's not duplicative. And then you're never gonna get 100% of everybody super excited about this, but I think you can get a good majority of people on board if they find purpose in it, if they know that you are sitting down and talking with them together and something useful comes out of that discussion. And if you ask them, and you together the next time they know they're going to look at these goals. Next time we meet, they're going to look at these goals I'm setting today and whether I achieved them or not. Somebody is going to dig this document up and look at it again. It's not just a one and done thing. So if you design the process and the form in the right way, I think you can bring that purpose. You can bring that meaning and then it's going to encourage more people to want to do them. Great. Great answer, Dr. Lambert. Um, we have a question here about how about semi-annually with the semi-annual reviews? I would say yes, this ILP should be reviewed. Um, I know that in my program, my institution, my program director has a semi-annual reviews and he um, he actually goes over this, this form or the ILP that we had in place at the time and reviews that with the resident twice a year. So great, good question. Um, 
What time frame should SMARTY objectives cover? For example, in the next six months, or is it a shorter time frame, Dr. Yeah. Lambert? I think it depends on the the behavior or the skill that you're trying to develop. You know, if if you're trying to get a res if a resident is working on being more efficient in their clinic workflow, which is a, a hobby of mine to try to teach, you don't need six months to know. You can just you can know in a few half days of clinic is this new intervention working or useful or not. If you're trying to get them to show their perfect model their professionalism. If the issue is showing up to your rotations and being being on time and present and engaged in their learning on rotations, you're going to need more a longer amount of time to show that. So I, I think it kind of depends on um, it, it, it. There's not a right answer. It, it depends on what you want to try to dem what the what the learner needs to demonstrate that they can do and how much time does it take to be able to demonstrate that efficiently. We're going to have another webinar uh, later on. And I think Chris Emily is on here right now, but about entrustability, how much can you trust the resident to do this? Do you need to be over their shoulder? Do you need to be in the room? Do you need to be outside the room? Um, and so how long a time frame your objective should cover, how long is it going to take that resident demonstrating this for you to trust them um, to a certain level? Uh, so I would encourage you, though, to think on the shorter side, um, because the longer you go between setting the goal and re or setting the objective and reevaluating it, the more energy is going to be lost because they feel like it's not being inspected. They feel like it's not being um, followed up. So I would I would err on the side of and you can always check in more frequently and say, nope, we're still not there yet. Let's stay the course. That's OK. Um, but I would encourage you to err on the on the shorter side. Somebody tells me I want you to get better at this and I'll check on you again in six months it's going to go on my back burner to be on it. It's, it's not going to be in the forefront until five and a half months from now. <laughs> yeah. well, um, um, that they, uh, one of our users uses the crucial conversations program to help with personality issues. So for the question about that, that might be something that could help. Mm -hmm. um, As a question about, would you use this process for issues identified by the program, but not recognized by the resident? And that's a great question. I think that is absolutely a great place to incorporate it into the discussion with their faculty advisor or, men or mentor or coach, whatever your title may be. Um, that That is why residents don't just create these all by themselves because they have blind spots. We all have blind spots, right, in our, in our performance and our abilities. Um, so I think as you sit and listen to what the resident has come up with um, for their strengths and struggles, if you or the faculty as a group have identified one that they don't seem to be noticing, that's where you put it in. You say, you know, I like two of your, I, I like your ideas. I think we can work on two of these, but I really think one of them should be this. How do you feel you're doing in this aspect? And pull in their kind of a little bit of forced reflection um, on that and bring that in. This is not a blank check for the resident to set whatever goals they want, it, it, they should initiate, but it is still done together. And you absolutely, as a faculty, if you see an important thing that is uh, lacking uh, or needs to be better, please feel free to put that in the discussion and work together to decide. I'll ask the resident, how do you think, how do you think you can demonstrate this to me over the next three months? What kind of, what kind of learning do you need so that you can show me that you have learned this. And you can you can bring it up and then kind of put it back on them and open that discussion rather than just saying, you need to get better at this and here's what I'm gonna have you do. Make it a discussion to get their buy-in. Um, and we only have, I think another, um, another um, minute or two. Uh, resource, last reason? question. Sorry, go ahead, Pamela. Do you have any resources or strategies to help resident meet these goals? Specifically, a big one I see is a lot is clinic workflow. Mm -hmm. That's a tough one. There are, I like I said, I one of my favorite things to teach residents is efficiency. And there is not a lot of data. There are not a lot of studies on efficiency in medicine. And most of the ones that are out there are uh, either in the ER or OBGYN and those are not the same workflows that we have in our in our clinic. Um, so 
in terms of resources, I would say pairing them up with multi, not just one, but multiple faculty who are uh, pretty good at whatever the workflow is that they are struggling with so they can see different ways of, of achieving the same thing. Um, and also uh, making sure that you are targeting very specific behaviors. Ask, ask why a bunch of times, the five why method. Um, why are you slow in your clinic workflow? Well, I'm slow because I can't get out of the room on time. Well, why are you, why are you having trouble getting out of the room on time? Until you really get to a very specific thing that you can work with them to target to change. Just saying you're gonna work on being faster in clinic is not observable or measurable, it's not good enough. We need to really drill down to something very specific and say, I want you to get better at this specific thing and then let's see how you're doing. Wow, such wonderful questions from our audience. Um, I'd like to say thank you to our panelists um, for sharing with us your time and your expertise on individualized learning plans. Um, and also to our audience for your wonderful participation and making time for us. Um, whether you are watching this live or you are participating in the recording later on, we do have a survey that we would very much appreciate you filling out. The QR code is on your screen and a link is in the chat. Um, but if you um, would be able to visit um, STFM's CBME toolkit, the recording for this webinar will be there along with many, many other tools that were mentioned in today's webinar. And that can be found at stfm.org slash CBME toolkit. Um, thank you so much for joining us today and we hope you have a wonderful day.